Grumble and Growl on Oria TV. Welcome back to Grumble and Growl. I'm Gail Tosh, your host, as we examine issues from the local to the global perspective. Today, as promised, folks, we have international award winner, best-selling author, and the inventor and creator of Per Per Self, author Marge Piercy. Marge, welcome to the show today. Thank you. <laughs> Glad to see you. Well, Marge, I have to tell you, I first came across your book, Woman on the Edge of Time, when I was a freshman in college, and it was part of the curriculum that was um, based on dystopia versus utopian writings. So I'm just wondering, what was going on uh, at the time that you wrote the book, so that you thought this story was important? Basically, at that point in time, when the women's movement was pushing forward and we were making a lot of changes, and so was a lot of the other new left, we, there was a sense of hope. Now, utopian fiction comes from a lack but it's a like that you imagine there can be ch ch something going forward. There were a lot of feminist utopias at that point, and they all shared certain characteristics. A whole new way of bringing up children that was not a woman alone with her kids, but a communal thing. Uh, uh -huh. Integrating older people into society, equality. Now, who wants equality? Those people who don't have it. You don't generally see Bezos or somebody right. running off of wanting more equality. Right. He doesn't want more billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> well, he may like the whole you associate with if there aren't enough billionaires. People with more than a certain amount of money are uncomfortable right. with anyone who doesn't have that amount of money. The thing about equality is if everyone gets it, there's just more of it. There's You don't lose it if you already have it. You don't lose anything. When you bring other people up to your level, they just are there. You, it... In any event, why, the reason why people aren't writing utopias now is that we're fighting to try to retain the rights we won with such effort. Yeah. And we're losing yeah. after Trump. Everything went to hell. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I got involved. That's why I'm doing the show. So one of the things about Woman on the Edge of Time was there was this pronoun, per, yeah. which was short for person. And this profoundly changed my life because instead of now looking at people and immediately putting them in a category, they were now people. So gender, class, race, religion, all of this kind of faded away for me. Is, is that what you were looking for when you came across it? Like, how did you come up with this pronoun and why did we need it? Well, I thought that a society of true equality in which there was tremendous fluidity of gender uh, would not be, could be hindered by he, she, and it, which is why a lot of people use they now. Mm -hmm. I've used it as a plural for. I don't know how many years long before it got to be popular. Uh -huh, really? And I would have huge fights with editors about it. <laughs> uh, the, but, but now here we are kind of living your society that you dreamed up. So how do you feel about that now? Feel about what? We haven't gotten much of any place. Well, then we're the, backsliding. I agree with you on a lot of things. But the they them is a lot more uh, mainstream now, which is yes. a lot more, uh, which which speaks to our gender fluid movement mo moment that we're having in society, which you kind of spoke about er earlier than I was aware of it. So, well, I was bisexual for many years mm -hmm. and until you weren't supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many labels these days. I don't even know where you could cat people categorize themselves. And I Whoa. just, I just like per for people. We're all oh. just people. Fausta Sterling. Oh, you know who she is. I do not, but oh. I'm gonna, going to after this interview. She's a geneticist. She says there isn't two sexes. There's a whole spectrum. Everybody, very few people are at far end of masculine or what's considered masculine, what's considered feminine. Most of us are somewhere in between. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, genetically and temperamentally in every way. Yeah. Our sexuality and all of us. We're, right. We're we're far more fluid than we think we are. We have this strong individualism, but in truth, every time you form a strong relationship, you change. You become a somewhat different person. True. We're all far more fluid than we think we are. That's true. A lot of us like to say we don't embrace change or we do embrace change, but change happens whether we're embracing it or not, and we are Believe moving me. through that fluidity. So that brings me to a question. Like, you've been a feminist for a long time. Yeah. And a feminist author, so you're shaping the feminist's um, speech here in our society. How do you, how has your feminism changed over the decades? And do you think we're in a good, I, I think already, I think I know you think we're in a bad place. So talk to me a little bit about that. Well, there's an enormous pushing back. And a huge amount of money has gone into pushing things back. And there are a whole lot of powerful white men who want things the way they were. They dream of the 50s when women knew their place and bustled around, taking care of men and having no ambitions. Just, oh, let me please you. Let me have your babies. Let me cook your supper. Let me clean your house. That's all I want. <laughs> and blacks knew their place. Oh, yeah. And the gays uh, and... they weren't uppity. And uh, Latinx people were all in their proper places. Everybody behaved themselves. Yeah. Uh, and they had everything they wanted. Mm hmm and they dream about that. And they're, the Supreme Court is trying to thrust all that to back. To bring that back. Yeah, how disappointing is that? That all the, the Supreme Court for. is walking us backwards. Oh, my God. And we fought so hard for these mm -hmm. things. Yeah. It's, it's heartbreaking. It is. It is heartbreaking. And the fight, the fight continues. Um, there, are, there are people still going forward. So. Oh, of course. Yeah. When I was... <clears throat> 18, mm -hmm. home from college for the last time I went home from college. <laughs> uh, I got pregnant. I had had my first relationship with a male. I've had many relationships with women earlier, but my, that was my first relationship with a male. I didn't realize how dangerous <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> uh, I got pregnant. I was poor. Mm -hmm. I was on scholarship. I worked... I, my parents didn't want me to go to college. Right. I had you first, were the first person in your family to go to college. Yeah, but they, and they didn't want it. Oh, wow. They wanted me to... My mother's highest ambition for me was that I would be able to work in a, an office. That's, that was my mom's ambition for me as well. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't my ambition. <laughs> Nor mine. <laughs> uh, anyhow... Uh, what, what did I get started? Oh, I had, I couldn't, couldn't get an abortion. I couldn't find any way of doing it. No doctor recommended who would help me. So I had to abort myself. Oh my goodness. And I almost died. I, it it sounds almost, horrifying just you saying it. Yeah. Oh, it was horrifying. It was, I can't tell you how painful it was. And I almost bled to death. I'm glad you didn't. I'm glad you're here. You had stories that you needed to tell that are important for people. Well, I started immediately. Uh, every time I heard of an abortionist who was any good, I kept a record. I had a, a whole file of, of it, and for years I helped women get abortions. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your service. That's really important, especially right now when we have networks set up. We just did, um, if you haven't seen this, an issue on uh, Sister Song who helps black and brown women in the South um, create pathways to the North to get abortions. Then there's that little girl who had an who was raped by her uncle, had an abortion before and then went back to seventh grade. Oh, uh, yeah. It makes me so angry, yeah. I can't tell you. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, and it used to be so awful. I remember this uh, girl in my eighth grade class who was raped by four men in the park. And she got pregnant, and they forced her to have a child. 
and so she wasn't allowed back in school. Yeah, so, so she, she never finished eighth grade. She loses her education. She loses her potential income. She, she everything. Yeah, just and plus everybody shunned her. Yes, no one wanted to be near she, her. She was a rape victim. It's your fault. Right. You were dressed wrong. You shouldn't have been in the park at four, at three or three between three and four in the afternoon. Oh, geez. You know, I, 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 I want to think that we've come a little bit far from there, but oh, I think yes. in reality, sometime in some places, it still is a reality that that happens quite a bit, oh. quite a bit. Um, you're and, and, and it's it, when I was doing consciousness raising, starting. Uh, that's what we did in, when I was in the, the women's movement in New York. Uh, and when I came to the Cape, I started the first women's group on the Cape. Oh, wow. uh, we did a lot. I discovered in every consciousness group I started, at least a third of the women had been raped. Oh, my goodness. Oh.